Hello everybody, today I'll be summarizing one of the book by Malcolm Gladwell, Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. A few points about the author. His full name is Malcolm Timothy Gladwell. He is an English-born Canadian journalist, born on September 3rd, 1963 in Fareham, United Kingdom. He is a non-fiction writer, journalist, cultural commentator, intellectual adventurer, and a staff writer in the New Yorker magazine since 1996. His style of work includes the implication of research in social science. He uses extensive uh, use of the research which is done in academic work and he tries to relate those research results with the stories of the social uh, things that he found in the society. His uh, work emphasizes in sociology, psychology and social psychology. So anybody who is interested in reading about these, so it, this is a must read. I am not much into non-fiction books but this is the one that I really like. Other notable works by Malcolm are The Tipping Point, How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference, Malcolm Gladwell, What the Dogs Saw, Outliners. So I know Dr. Prasad has talked about outline, Outliner many times when he tries to pinpoint things in statistics. David Goliath, Underdog, Misfits and the Art of Battling Goliath. Giants. Goliath. So what is the theme of the book? So the blink is about snap judgment. When, whenever you meet somebody, you try to judge, you, you're not doing it consciously, but as soon as you meet someone, you make that unconscious judgment in your mind. Maybe how the person looks, how he dresses, how he reacts, what his or her body language is, but that decision is made in just a snap of time, maybe a few seconds, one or two seconds, or maybe milliseconds, we don't even know. So Blink is about snap judgment, not how to make them, but how they are made. Who makes them the best and what are the factors involved in it? Snap judgments may be right sometimes, but they may be wrong sometimes. So, for example, if you meet someone and you say, oh, this is a very nice person, but as soon as you try to know that person more, you think, like, oh, maybe I was wrong by judging this person. So, real world examples on snap decisions, which are based on the instant. So, I'll be sh uh, showing you a few examples from the book. There are a lot many, but I've tried to pick up few which are important to all of us. Importance of understanding one's instincts and application of one instance in taking quick decisions and removing our biases. What are the strengths of the books? So it ventures into a relatively new psychological concept called adaptive judgment. So Malcolm has divided a human mind into conscious, uh, rational and adaptive consciousness, which is like we are judging, you're trying to judge a book from its cover. Social agenda to correct our prejudices based on our past experiences or biased consciousness. So we, may we try to make a judgment based on our experience. So we try to be, there's an example which shows that we are racist. We don't tend to be racist, but unconsciously we become racist. Introduces concept of thin slicing for taking snap decisions. What is adaptive judgment? So the part of our brain that leaps to conclusions is called adaptive consciousness. This new notion of adaptive consciousness is thought of inst uh, instead as a kind of a giant computer that quickly and quietly processes a lot of information, a lot of data we need in order to keep functioning as a human being. So I just, just want to you know, little linger around this particular point in thought. Um, I would guess or I would think that um, a brain doesn't necessarily process everything only on the facts, right? Uh, more or less, uh, it's um, as we do. You know, we all of us make snap judgments. Um, some of the most important decisions we have to make. Some, I, I just talking to somebody about decision that essentially would commit each. You know, both of us for five year journey kind of thing, right? That's, that's a pretty big investment, big, you know, for both the parties involved. The result typically needs to be yes or no, right? I mean, either you do that or not. You, you, it's like you're buying a house. A lot of things you like, don't like. The result has to be either, okay, I, I, I want to put a bid on this house or move on. Uh, so we cons constantly make these kind of very important decisions, but I don't think that our brain, I mean, you try to analyze your process, I don't think we are going through one our direct plan, one thing after another thing, after another thing. Uh, 
and, and certainly we are not listing all of them. I would guess that um, the computers would uh, have access to all of them. They would look to, they would look, they would, if you write programs for computers or you train computers or whatever, typically the tendency would be for us to give the computer, the computer algorithm, everything that is relevant. Right? So when we are, suppose we are training in a computer to make a decision, or an algorithm to make a decision, kind of ones that I just described, buying a house or committing uh, you know, on a fire journey or uh, committing on a lifetime journey, right? Uh, uh, that, that kind of stuff, you are making, we are not doing it by listing every piece of data that could be relevant. But if we are to write algorithms for computers to do that, I would guess that we would say, what are all the data that you need, right? Where have you, where have you consciously tried to create algorithms? Where the algorithm is not based on all the data, but something between the data and the decision. What I would, what I have called abstractions, broadly, and what others might have called abstractions, or some other words uh, you know, akin to that. But we are giving weight to one or the other things in order to choose, say, house or something like that. So why is it more different? Like, suppose in an algorithm, we could give more weight to this feature or something like that to get this decision. Let's just think about it. I, when I was, uh, you know, some of you have you know, been at my, my house, right? I think it was just the round thing about the kitchen. And the, the one, you know, height on the back, <coughs> that's about it. That made it. Could I have ever imagined uh, putting in um, my algorithm saying that uh, I'll be looking for this feature? I would not be even aware of those features. Right? You look at a person, uh, you know, uh, who might be your friend or who might be your spouse. And um, that person, uh, uh, you know, for me it's been many years now since I had to think about it, but I'm just guessing that that person may not be so-called world's best looking person, let's say. But you might find, forget about the looks, you might find a part of mannerism that would uh, simply uh, overweigh all the other characteristics you would have come up with. If you made a rational, well thought out process of what would you like, so one thing, one of the, my things would be a decent looking person. Well, the whole concept of look might be, you may put on the side because you just like the mannerism. Or I'll give you my own personal example. So, uh, you know, when I met my wife for the very first time, one thing totally, you know, just basically she chose not to put up a makeup. Okay? Come to, you know, this was sort of an arranged kind of marriage and parents knew each other, blah, blah. But, um, uh, and I, I, I was totally taken, you know, taken, swept away with that decision. All the other fee part, potential partners I met uh, had come up well prepared, well dressed, with all the makeup on. And it is this totally, uh, you know, um, unexpected, unpla you know, kind of uh, thing that did it. Right? I mean, that I, I you know, thought about it and say, oh, okay. And I said, why did you not put up, put, put up the makeup? And you know, say, so, well. And, you're going to see me every day. If if you are going to be married, then you will see every day this way. <laughs> if you don't like that, I mean, what what would it be, right? <laughs> so, but 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 the, those attributes based on which we make these decisions, those are also something that we have we have learned. Over you know, the time. No, no. The thing is, if if you ask a kid which house to buy, he won't have an. He, he won't have enough knowledge about uh, whether I should go for one with big rooms or small rooms. Over the time, we learned that those attributes would make a difference. And if we ask a machine 
to consider those attributes, the an optimization algorithm is trying to find the similar thing. And I don't think so. Or, or I'm arguing, okay, that that is not the case. Why? What I'm arguing. So, so, so. Let's say our best thing would be a neural net kind of thing, or let's say the best. Um, algorithm to train would be some deep learning algorithm. Let's say that I am looking at my house and I am looking at um, uh, uh, how well aesthetic the house is, right? Where would I find um, that point where my aesthetics really takes over with that round Thing that we have in the kitchen, and how would you ever um, have an algorithm pick that that would be the aesthetic thing, even if I had given a million pictures to the algorithm to be trained from? No, the feature selection is not something that I think algorithm can do better than a human can. But the thing is, even as a human, we learn that those features makes difference for us. That is, if something like that is there, then a house is beautiful. But so. the, the point is that, I mean, I there's only one house of that kind that I ever came across that had that, you know, feature. The other thing that I'm trying to really get to is that, imagine, think, think about the aesthetics as a node that is somewhere, um, you know, unconscious and that is somewhere um, you know, not necessarily Rational. rationally put out. I mean, you know, uh, res you know, really saying box to be ticked off. It's also think that you have these images, how something looks to a decision. These are some things that are somewhere in the in, term, in, in the middle. We don't, you know, which I, you know, which are these abstractions. They are not really defined. Also, imagine, you know, that decision is mine. And my decision is all that matters in buying the house. Are you going to train the algorithm for my decisions? And how do you do that? Do we train a deep learning algorithm for an individual's decision? Giving a choice of decisions. Huh? Giving a choice to you for deciding on what is better. So. No, no, no. We are talking about we are, when we are writing, we are taking algorithms and training them to make a decision, mm -hmm. right? Take help, make decision. Are we training them to make a, a decision for individual me, no, or are we training see. for no. a general user coming to select the house and which house will be more uh, valuable? It's very personalized. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. it's very personalized. So. And and and. The personalization, what I'm trying to also get to is that what we are personalizing in all are also highly individualistic, highly personal. What you personalize on is highly personal. And it's not the same for each of us. Right? So it's a what I'm talking about here is plausible arguments why making those things, you know, uh, making computers decide for humans why that is hard. Right? And that's also one point, which is like brain is not a computer. We can use that if you want to argue that way. Maybe like a but you know there are counter arguments we can go go with that. But point here is that explicit to to me, I wanted to simply point out that I'm I'm sold on or I'm I'm intrigued by this concept of abstractions, and that the fact that we need to more explicitly understand whatever what the whatever those things are. That. Or, or let me put very simply what I'm trying to get to is that given a data, it's not necessarily it's not necessarily sufficient to give a data and some algorithm to come with a decision. There is often in our thought process, in our decision making process, in human brain, there's often something called abstraction, which is not data. Which are your preferences, which are your personal biases which are cultural biases, which are whatever those things are. And it is these things that we are not paid enough uh, attention to. So 
if I want to argue that um, uh, you know computer is you know bra uh, you know brain is a computer, I would then argue that oh, okay, it's possible for me to then define cultural bias, religious bias, da 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 da, and also train that oh, the fact that we are not doing doesn't mean that you know uh, brain is not a computer. It's just that we have not reached that level of specificity. So I can argue the other side also, right? So I'm not here to argue one or the other one. <laughs> it's you, for you guys to do it. So I think that this might be one of the reasons we have two systems of judgment, right? Thinking fast and slow. You know, we have the first judgment called the, the judgment based on our intuition, our biases, sometimes even by our sixth sense, extra sensory perception, right? Basically. And the other, the second way of judgment is, you know, rules and trick, some of control, and, you know, we consume a lot of data. And I think Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman, Kahneman. Kahneman. I think that's in his book, talks a lot about this one. I, just I think it's one of them, I think some, somebody some will be reading his book. But, the, but, but, okay, let's just talk about this. And I think that's, th those two are not sufficient. On one side, you write rules explicitly how to do the things, other side you train. Uh, you know, another sort of, you know, divergence. So, think about, talk about NLP, right? Um, uh, uh, ten years ago, the predominant, uh, you know, uh, form in which people were doing NLP, because I, I, I co-founded a company for, um, um, uh, you know, the healthcare thing, uh, clinical text understanding, and uh, they, they still are. Uh, and the domain companies, uh, five, ten years ago, where once were, uh, they had a bunch of linguists writing, uh, you know, there were kind of like hundreds of them hired and they were working in um, Eastern Europe country, country to encode all the rules for understanding clinical notes, understanding each of the clinical concepts with possibly uh, healthcare, you know, uh, uh, related ontology, disease and that kind of stuff. And they would say, you know, if this occurs and that occurs and this, then it is that kind of stuff. And then, more in the most recent years, they've been replaced by, um, um, by 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 learning based uh, algorithms, machine learning based algorithms, uh, as opposed to rule based algorithms. Uh, so you know, I think more recent um, NLP advances are coming from machine learning and deep learning rather than from rule based system that used to be done before. But the important thing to recognize is that. In many situations, our computational approaches are data to end decisions, but they are devoid of something that is there in the middle, intermediate things. Again, what I call abstractions. Explicit modeling of abstraction has, is, has not been done in our computational thing. Again, for our research group, and maybe one or two of you, that is a potential uh, you know, uh, opportunity to do something where you'd be able to explicitly model intermediate things that are meaningful. That's why for, for quite some time I've been, you know, pushing ourselves to really uh, try and understand what each layers in a deep learning network does to possibly uh, figure out a way to work with that, you know, what is at that layer, right? That's why the visualization thing was, you know, I think it's very important that this is how the algorithms work today. If we can explicitly understand what each layer is and we can bring in external knowledge to, and I think it's very similar to the kind of things you are trying to do, uh, you know, uh, Shreyans, in, you know, using the knowledge to, on the edges, right? So, but in, that, in this case, it will be a little different, you know, representation, but uh, the idea is to, if we can figure that out, what is it that we can say, X, you know, is good, not good, what to focus on, not to focus on. So what if, for example, I was doing uh, deep learning on some images related to um, good, good looking pictures, aesthetically good looking pictures for house or for, you know, scenic pictures or whatever those things are. And what if I was able to identify in my network more explicitly the concept of Structural aesthetics, color related aesthetics. You see what I'm saying? If I have a top concept of aesthetics, there are still components of thereof. 
And they are abstractions that are not that low level things. And you can say that this is aesthetic, you know, this, this structure aesthetics is going to be appealing to anybody who likes rounded things. And this will be anybody who likes squarish things. Right? You see what I'm saying? So more explicit understanding of intermediate thing is what I think is going to come next. Whether we figure out how to do it or somebody else will figure out how to do it. As opposed to, here are the, pic here are the, here's the data, here's the algorithm, comes up with something. Why? Because that always has the limitation that because you don't know anything intermediate, in, in, in middle, it's like solving a broad problem. Which stock, will the stock will go up or down? And that, is, you to think about the problem, will stock decision making, so will stock go up or down? Well, that is applicable to anybody, any buyer. But will I buy the stock or not? That's a very different thing. Suppose I'm a socially conscious buyer. I will have to bias my network to incorporate that. How do I, you know, without buy, you know, putting in the knowledge about what is a, a company that is uh, acceptable, a company should not be, um, uh, you know, the uh, US, one of the reasons why apartheid was uh, removed was because of economic decision making that uh, US and other uh, countries decided not to invest in companies that were associated with apartheid. Right? So the similar, now there are socially conscious things saying the environmentally co companies that are environmentally cons not conscious, we don't want to invest in them. Now I have to bias my network to incorporate them, right? It's that kind of work that is very interesting. Think about, again, think about deep learning that, um, you know, uh, gives you a uh, stock buy or sell. Then now think, how are you going to improve, the, how, how are you going to adapt the algorithm to incorporate social bias? I mean, socially, uh, uh, you know, social good kind of, you know, uh, investments. Well, you, how, where do you get it? Right? There's some knowledge that you have to bring in, right, that this company is this or not. You know, somebody has to tell label that that Coca Cola is a, this kind of thing, Exxon is this kind of thing, and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, like an explanatory model, which I saw in the other post in our in the group. Explanation, I think, is uh, probably altogether different matter, and um, by um, uh, uh, again um, one of the biggest. Disadvantage and that this everybody, even the top uh, deep learning people, will agree with is that uh, you know, current uh, deep learning techniques are not amenable to explanation, they, they don't, you know, they just come up with results, not why, right? And that's not, you know, think about my decision making process. I had gone ahead and seen several houses, so and then I had shortlisted three houses. So when my wife came. Uh, from, we moved from uh, Athens, Georgia, and my wife came uh, during uh, spring break to see the houses. I shortlisted three, and I was I was able to describe. I like this house because of this. I like this because of that. I like because of that. Without that explanation, our process simply would be optimal, right? Useful. She needs to know why I like this, and I'm willing to pay uh, extra money, higher than our budget. You know. To do that, and without that, I like it. Yes or no would not have done anything, right? To this discourse, you see. These are examples of opportunity. I, I hope I gave you some real examples to think about, as to what are the limitations in current deep learning or machine learning techniques, and why we need to bring in uh, knowledge. Why need to uh, probably figure out a way to explicitly represent abstractions, a model. You call you can people can use a lot of different things, some some sort of model of the world I, I, into this uh, process. And once if you can figure that out, then I think we will make big thing. Anyway, I took. so Blink's proposition for a different and better world. So decision made very quickly can be very bit as good as decision made made consciously, cautiously, and deliberately. So there are examples where a patient, where a person is given a lot of information and a lot of time to think about, and there are situations where people are not given that much amount of information and time, but the decision that they keep, that uh, they make are quite a less similar. Our instincts fail us for specific and consistent set of reasons. Sometimes our instincts are not always right. These reasons can be identified and understood. 
the power of knowing in, is in first two seconds. It's not a gift given magically to a fortunate few. It's an ability that we can cultivate ourselves. So this is what Dr. Shetz talk about, the abstract abstraction that we can think about. So this is the chapter first of the, uh, the book, and this is the very first example that he gave, the statue that didn't look right. So there is this person who comes to the J. Paul Getty's museum, and he comes up with a statue of a BC great, uh, Greek statue known as Chorus, and he uh, said that this statue belonged to the 6th century. The museum people, they were like, oh my god, this is the very first time somebody has this uh, statue was uh, lost somewhere and they thought that this is a very authentic statue and they wanted to test it before they purchased this statue from the guy. They put the statue through various tests of age, background, check into the documentation and they come up, came up with a conclusion of this is an authentic statue. They also asked various asked historians to come up and view the statue to not only uh, rely on the tests that they have done, but also on the word of their mouth. That uh, oh, since you are well aware of the history, you are you know about the paintings, art, sculptures, you may be able to judge it better. Everybody who came to view this statue, they were like, oh yeah, this looks authentic. This is a real one and this is not a forged statue. But one of the Italian art historian, Federico Zeri, he observed that statue's fingernailed and he said, something's wrong with him. When he was asked what was wrong with the statue, he didn't. He, he couldn't. He couldn't say that what is wrong, but he said something is wrong about the statue. They eventually ended up not buying this, although they have put it up in the museum. And it was later on discovered that this statue was put into potato mold for a long period of time, which made the statue pass all the uh, authenticated tests that it was gone through. And it's now in the museum with a placard showing about 350 old BC or modern forgery. This is actually a forged statue. So why some of the experts knew upon their first glance at the statue that something was wrong? Let's explore. So learning to blink. Then he talks about the art of thin slicing. It is the ability of our subconscious to find patterns in situations and behavior based on very narrow slices of our experience. We need a careful attention of just a few minutes, a few seconds to take that decision. There are a few other thin slicing experiments done. So there was one experiment by psychologist John Gottman from the University of Washington. He did a love lab experiment. So he picked few test couples uh, and he observed the couples for 15 minutes or less and he trained his lab, uh, his lab assistant to observe their facial expressions. So the couples were put up with like, they were asked to discuss about few of their uh, family issues, just like about the day or something they dislike or not. So there was a discussion where they were talking about their dog. So the wife loved the dog, but the husband did not. He didn't like the dog around the room. And all they have to do is just observe them for, few, for 15 minutes and not their words, but their facial expressions. And based on their facial expressions, they were able to uh, come up with a hypothesis that will their marriage last for 15 years or not. And for the 90% of the time, they were quite right. There's another experiment by Nalini Ambedi's ex uh, with, uh, which talks about which doctor will be sued by the patient. This is basically how much, it depends on how much time a doctor spends with a patient. So sometimes when the patient comes, you spend, okay, how are you doing? Are you feeling okay? Then they talk about some personal stuff. Oh, is your daughter, if they are a little bit personal, is their daughter doing okay? Is your uh, leg feeling fine or not? Versus other doctors who just know, okay, what are you feeling? What are your symptoms? Blah, 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 write the medication and ask them to go. So when, if something goes wrong with the patients, patients are more likely to sue the second category of the uh, doctors versus the first one. So even if the first... Uh, they, they are likely to sue the ones who talk Who, who just uh, do a direct, okay, well, these are your symptoms, these are the medication, go and do these tests, and blah, that's it. And who are like more social. How are you doing? How are you feeling today? The ones who are less social will likely to sue, yep. sue more. Yeah. Locked door or our unconsciousness. So our, un so our conscious mind can be primed, it can be trained. The way we think and act is a lot more susceptible to our outside influence. People are ignorant about things that affect their actions, yet they rarely feel ignorant. We don't know we'll make a racial uh, judgment in the back of our mind, but we will make it. 
Wick Brandon, he's a top tennis coach and he can predict when a player will make a double fault. When he was asked how you do it, he, he just know how, he just know that I can do it, but he, if you ask him how do you make that decision, he does not know that point. There's another experiment of speed dating. So in this experiment, there were like 15 men and 15 women and they were uh, asked, so each person will spend five minutes with each other. Before the experiment, they were asked to link, list down a list of attribute or the list of characteristics that they are looking in a person. But in the end of the ex experiment, they always chose a person who was totally opposite to the characteristic that they have listed down. When they were asked why, they couldn't figure out why. It was just the decision that they made, the snap judgment. Like you made, Dr. Shiv. <laughs> <laughs> so, but sometimes blinking may lead us astray. Our first expressions, uh, impressions are generated by experiences and environment. Our unconscious mind form opinions from our experiences. Our unconscious attitudes may have elements of prejudice and discrimination. This influences our behavior in certain spontaneous situations. So there's this test of implicit association test. Do we have biases? So in one part of the test, there were two category of uh, people and they were shown their faces. The first one, good or European, European American, uh, white, good or European American. And the other category was bad and African American or just African or the pe uh, basically the black people. And the second test was good Africans, bad European American. People took more time in uh, the second part of the test than in the first part of the test. So they were more likely to associate white good with Af uh, European American and bad with African Americans. They would quickly do that. But while for the uh, reverse part of this test, they had to spend a lot of time. So, uh, so their decisions were basically biased. This is where the uh, snap judgment went wrong. So this is one of uh, the US president, and he was known as the worst president in the American history, Warren Harding. So there were two people in, um, I guess, uh, I don't remember the, uh, the year. So one was Harry, uh, Harry Doctrine, uh, and the another one is uh, Warren Harding. So Warren Harding was a, a newspaper editor in, May, in Ohio, and uh, Harry was a lawyer and a, a politician. The first time Harry met Warren, he was like, oh, he's quite a charismatic pers uh, person and he should, he looks presidential. So he should run for the pres uh, as a Senate or for the presidential post. Warren, on the other hand, was a womanizer, not much of a smart person, but he was good in presenting himself well. Harry trained Warren and he uh, just go there and he was in the background, just say these speeches, be look presidential, be smart, tall, handsome. And uh, ultimately, he was uh, appointed as the he was elected as the president of the uh, pres U.S. president. So this comes up with a point that we tend to be uh, how would I say that we have a bias against the tall, smart, uh, tall and handsome uh, men. Bias for ba bias for for towards the tall and handsome men. In another example, there's a Bob Gola uh, Golom. He's an in a sun salesman on, in the town of Flemington. He sells in an off, on an average of 20 cars a month, and this is twice as a, a rate of an average salesman. In general, a car salesman, uh, salesman tends to have a bias for um, a customer based on how the customer appears, in which car he or she came, and what is it, budgets. But Bob does not make such kind of prejudices. So uh, in one study, it concludes that white men receive initial price offers for cars that are about $200 less than the initial price offered to white women and $1,000 less than initial price offered to black men. And the study proves that car dealers are racist. Car, I'm not, I didn't say that. The book says that. Car dealers assume that women and black people are less intelligent than white people and therefore try harder to sell them an overpriced vehicle. The problem uh, with this hypothesis is not that the men and women who participated in this study were college graduates. So they were graduate, they were educated people in, uh, in this study. Still, they had this racial bias. So snap judgment sometimes can be prejudicial and objectively wrong. Blinking under decisive situations. 
Blinking make, uh, decision making relies on balance between deliberate and instinctive thinking. Frugality of information matters in taking snap decisions. Snap decision sometimes also provides the edge. So, Paul Van Riper, he was appointed as a commander during the Vietnam War uh, in Vietnam. And he was the general who defeated the U.S. Army in a game war uh, situation which was known as the Millennium Challenge. So, once uh, in 2000, in 2000 Pen uh, Pentagon official they uh, created a, game, uh, a simulated game situation of a war and they named it as Millennium Challenge. They asked him to, uh, so they divided the uh, military into two groups. One was the blue team, another one was the red team. And uh, Riper was uh, appointed as a commander of the red team. The blue team had all sorts of information that they wanted. using. Uh, so they had a tool known as operational net assessment. So they had information about a country's social uh, status, economical condition and political condition. If you look up this thing in a real life situation, in the present situation, before going to war, we try to hurt uh, your opponent country for, on their social, political and economic status. War is always the last option that these days we, we go for. So what happened in this um, experiment was, uh, this took in Suffolk, uh, West Virginia, and they were kind of in a similar, like, it was simulated, but it looked kind of a real war uh, situation. Blue team had access to all these information versus red team had a very, I would say, they were outnumbered for in comparison to the uh, uh, blue team and they did not have any information related to their, uh, or very few information related to their enemy. But still, although they were give, uh, had a lot of information, but Riper made a, uh, he focuses on very short meetings, quick decisions, and he defeated the blue team. So sometimes this was a snap judgment or a snap decision. Sometimes a lack of information also provides you an edge. Whereas the blue team was, invest, uh, was more interested in trying to analyze all the information given to them, made, having long meetings, discussing, okay, this will be the strategy, this is the next step. And but it, but that's, that's another, you know, again, um, uh, it, it tells you that maybe data is not complete. Uh, it may be that uh, the snap judgments are being made on uh, things other than what these particular data things are about. For example, um, the data may not say under what circumstances your opponent would buckle. For example, would give up to fight as an example. But you have every information there is available. It, it, because that has not happened before. That, that, so team, that particular team you know, it has never been put into exactly the same circumstances as this war is. So there is, nobody can make that decision. Nobody, nobody knows that. They made the first move. So the blue team made the first move of uh, connect, disconnecting the communication challenge. They may have made the first move based on the data that they have saying that they have superior power or that there is first move advantage and so on and so forth. But then there is other parts, like again, it's, think about it as an intermediate, you know, an abstraction. In a, uh, other parts saying, un, at what level of um, adversity would this uh, team back back out, or or you know backtrack, or or give up the fight, or surrender? This is a an example of the things that is not typically, you know, this particular that team never fought a war of like this, and hence there is no um, way to judge, you know, how far you know uh, how willing they are to fight to the end. Uh, as an example. So uh, it may be that there are things that are not in the data, that are considerations that are nothing to do with, uh, they're not even, you know, uh, the, the data simply cannot measure, um, and, and hence uh, they, they play a very important role. So it is like playing a game. Um, the psychology of uh, calling somebody a bluff is not purely based on data, right? It is based on instinct, and that is not in the data. And now, how do you capture that? So that's the point. Although they have a lot of uh, all these information about their enemy country, still they were not able to. Yes. Win the, war. the point. So yeah. So so the point is that the fact that the blue team had all the data doesn't mean that it has to. Be. Yeah. Also, maybe all of that data may count into noise. Too much noise. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the general has more experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the general so had more general experience. Is on the other side. What 
I think you know, another factor might be what about the personality of the users? You know, some people have this direct personality. Some are you know, thinkers, they are analytical. And some you know, personalities like you know, relators. So this is a situation where a snap decision is making is providing you an edge. So it's better to make a snap decision in some situations versus another. I think it depends on the uh, on the like experience of the person who's making that judgment. It's exactly the same the, the same argument that Daniel Kahneman is making in the thinking fast and slow. If you are experienced, mm -hmm. then you are going to be fast in your judgments. You're going to make this snap decisions that are going to give you the edge. But alternatively, if you do not, you know, we don't have that uh, experience, then you're going to destroy your team. But we don't know how you came up uh, to that, or you how you concluded that decision. I think it's based on some commonalities that we can, like, immediately uh, we can relate by analogy. Like, you know, we've seen this in our back mind, then we can make that decision. Well, it's also that sometimes random behavior is hard to crack whenever you are doing some things randomly, the other team person or people, they just can crack. So risk taking. Yeah, so. yeah. You, you don't know how, it, how you did it. It's just. And, and you know, it's like uh, we currently run political system. Um, the person who is unpredictable is uh, doing a pretty good job for <laughs> I think that's the I think that's the work of, of simulating a meeting, for example, right? You start very random, and then you start uh, slowing down the the space of acceleration to to find something more sudden. So. Yeah, exactly, right? So you, you know, create more uh, data scope. But here's one question, maybe I want to present opinion about it. Uh, did you see that Facebook uh, released, uh, you know, announcing that they want to have human in the loop for uh, finding uh, fake news? Um, I mean, in the, in the argument of this book, I don't think it's a good idea, right? If you are presenting the same piece of news to a, to a group from North America, right? And you exactly show the same news to somebody else from another culture or another country, right? You will have different opinions. So now the population is gonna make, make the difference, not the actual factual stuff in it. There is actually one study that they asked some of the U.S. citizens, what do you think about immigration? Do you, are you pro or against? And uh, after getting these, uh, these, uh, these opinions from the citizens, uh, they were immediately asked. So if they say, okay, yeah, yeah I am pro, then they're going to ask them, okay, why, why are you pro? What, why, what is the deep insights that you have that made you pro or against? And then immediately you see the paper be tracking and saying, no, no, I'm actually not very pro, or you know, I'm not very against, because they don't have deep insights. So, I mean, snap decisions, if you are just a shallow person, it's gonna destroy your algorithms. And democracy is not for everyone. This is my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> the, the last part is very, uh, you know, uh, 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 I mean, you are more than welcome to go to places which is not democratic and be happy. No, no, no. But, uh, no, no, this is not, not my opinion. No, what I'm saying is democracy. You cannot ask everybody to come to the to something very, very uh, optimal, right? No. There are so many people you cannot even ask about their opinions because mm -hmm. you can in you many can of these cases yeah, we, we can come up with number of democratic countries who makes very bad they, they make very bad decisions, but on the other hand, who are we to say from outside that that majority was wrong? So let's say Polish uh, you know society chose a very uh, you know uh, relatively uh, uh, right wing or religious or extreme. Um, uh, you know, uh, government. Uh, now their government has uh, uh, stopped, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, they were liberal religiously, now they stopped um, uh, um, abortion as an example. Uh, earlier they were open to that. Or uh, for my Sri Lankan friends, now their um, uh, president has come with saying that women cannot buy alcohol. Guess what? I mean, so, you know, so uh, they are, they are so, you know, supposedly they are democracies, and, and of course, you know, US is universal example. But, but again, according to whom? And, and, and the point is that let's say that a majority, uh, let's, let's hypothesize that majority of the uh, people um, uh, uh, in in US uh, did not, uh, you, you, let's assume that historically we say this is a society of immigrants, country of immigrants, and let's say that current society, current electorates decides not to uh, you know, vote for somebody who is for uh, immigrants, they, they decide to vote for somebody who is against immigration. And let's say that um, they actually mean, they're not exactly for, um, uh, you know, against immigrants, they are against the current type of immigration. Like what Trump says to our countries, you know, so that, that immigration they don't want, they want immigration from Norway. Let's assume that that is the case. Well, who are we to say that this is a wrong decision, right? And how would you say that the decision in Russia, which is not democratic, uh, well, they can claim they are democratic also, uh, be any better necessarily? I don't think that these, uh, you know, uh, are easy to settle. Uh, the point, though, uh, anyway, your, your main question was what? I think that I was I wouldn't answer. What is the main it? question? Is do you think uh, the Facebook uh, initiative? Oh, okay. Well, humans are biased by themselves, by, by, by fact. You know, I, I don't see that humans can be completely unbiased. What you can say is that there are certain principles. So you can say that there are so-called journalistic principles. You can say that. And you can train people in what those principles are. And according to those principles, and, and you are hired people, at Facebook will hire the people, and will say you are subject to these standards. You are subject to the standards where, you know, I don't know if you know this EEOC statement in every U.S. hiring, equal opportunity thing, saying that we will, uh, our hiring practices, uh, you know, are oblivious to, our, you know, we will, will not consider national or identity, sexual orientation, racial thing, none of those are sub theoretically supposed to be part of any, any hiring, right? Uh, in fact, there are, you know, the generally rule is that I can't even supposedly hire, ask a um, person that I'm hiring for a full job, for a regular job. Uh, it's not the same, doesn't necessarily apply to student, but okay, that, are you married? I can ask that, theoretically. Um, um, so, um, uh, you can provide them those rules, and even if they have that, those bias, they're supposed to follow those rules. In that sense, you can, Facebook can, you know, do better than what they are doing now. We know that algorithms have, can, we, can, we can easily bias algorithms, right? We know that algorithms can easily bias, uh, you know, introduce bias in the system. Those both are being done. So you are left with humans. And we know that humans are biased. So you are left with humans who are subject to following certain rules and standards. And with, assuming that when they follow that, I think you should get what better than what we have. I think uh, as a system, as a human and the law of systems, um, you won't ask the sergeant to be replaced by the captain, right? By the higher, because that higher person is, is more experienced, he knows what he's talking about and so on and so forth, right? That's who I want in the loop, rather than somebody not you know, not experience and have shallow decisions and shallow opinions and so on. This is what I mean by democracy is not for everyone. Because we want some people who actually can rationalize their decisions and, you know, pack back up their decisions by some facts and so on. I agree. Yeah. So so there should be they should be subject to some standards here. Your standard is uh, you know better experience, so better education, whatever those things are. True, and and we have politicians in the U.S. and in India and many other places where they don't they want electorates to be some politicians want electorate to be dumb, less educated. In the U.S., it is generally you no know, thought that uh, 
uh, the left, uh, the, the right wing, you know, politicians don't want uh, highly educated people, and they are against um, education. They are against edu investment in education. They want to privatize education to make it less uh, accessible. All that kind of stuff. There's another uh, example of firefighters. So when once a group of firefighters, they went into a house, like a, a house full of fire, and they were told that the fire originated in the kitchen. When they were inside, they were they put a lot of water in there, but the fire was not responding to the water. The temperature was really high. Com the temperature was really high, and the main cause of fire in the kitchen would be a gas. The water should put off the fire, but it was not able to. When they moved from kitchen to living room, one of the firefighters immediately asked his fellow men to get out of the house. And as soon as they got out of the house, the, the house collapsed. He was When he was asked uh, why he took that decision, he could not. Uh, he, he only told him that I got an intuition that the fire was not, uh, uns or the fire was not put off by the water. The uh, te room temperature was extremely high, so it's, it's not nothing to do with the kitchen. There might be something in the living room uh, floor, or there was an electric circuit or something. So the decision of the logical and the rational de uh, decision it usually takes too long than their gut decision. If he would sit down with his fellow men, oh, this is not working. What should we do? They would have gotten burned or dumped into the in the house. So I just want to add something interesting here, though. Uh, these are expect are very uh, the, the point that uh, you just brought out are rather interesting and important with regards to things I am personally interested in that of perception and um, the snap judgment for example right so perception if uh, if if a if a um, um, you know object is flying on your you know and coming to your face you are you know going to duck and it will be involuntarily it will be a snap judgment. But there are many other uh, things that uh, you know uh, you end up doing, which are kind of um, reaction that you know you you take it uh, without necessarily uh, you know having to go through all the details. So our brain is able to understand what is important or critical uh, uh, much easier, much much more easily than um, uh, you know say oh I'll go through all the pos all the possibilities and then make a decision. Right, and, and we would be able to dynamically adjust what is important at what point of time. Uh, there may be not, you know, because uh, there may be totally unforeseen situation that that you come across, and you will make a decision without necessarily looking at you know, all the other options, right? Uh, if you are, uh, and some decisions will be even personal. Some people would jump out of the window in a fire and others who die in the inside the window and not jump out because they know they are going to die anywhere from 13th floor. Who, what, what is the decision? You person making chance that she, something might be there waiting, you know, to catch them and take that chance. Is that thing or somebody make, making chance that this door will be broken by some firefighters and I'll be able to get out until it's too late. Right? So, so we are uh, uh, able to um, um, do that. Uh, you know, deal with unexpected situations, we figure out a way to do it much better than I believe a rational process would do. Here I want to add one interesting thing. You, do you remember the perception cycle that we have used in the Corey's work? So um, you have um, um, observation and you, um, uh, you know, uh, create a hypothesis based on observation of what could be and to then validate among the hypotheses you have that, so this is the abductive reasoning part of it, and then you ask for you know more deductive reasoning. You ask for additional observations, which will allow you to thin out the uh, possible choices that you have, and and validate one of those hypotheses, right? Um, most of the you know in a computational sense, we have tried to build this in a way that the cycle will go through. We'll try to uh, possibly use a selectivity, uh, you know as a way to shorten the you know, number of times you have to go through the loop. What I mean here is that if you, for example, uh, ask a question where the answers would be far more focused, far more uh, you know, higher valued, right? Uh, so like when we ask, when you play a 20 question game, the question you should ask is one which will lead to the fewest possible answers. 
it will prune out the space most. That will be the you know uh, normal strategy, right? Which question I should ask more ne next, right? Among I can ask ten questions to validate my hypothesis. Which one I will ask? I'll ask the one that is the most specific that will yield the most specific uh, you know result or reduce the pr you know prune the subspace the most or reduce the subspace the most. That will be the general strategy. However, the question is whether our brain, in this aspect of snap judgment, our brain necessarily does that. So it, there is a theory that there will be theory that if I write a computational algorithm, I'll ask very methodically this question, and I'll ask the uh, let's say I can my algorithm will look for question whose answer will be uh, pruning the search space the most. But the intuition based thing may actually not follow that may actually ask a question that um, is more of a risk taking. That indeed, there will be only one answer and hence I picked it. I, I'm, being, I'm playing that game, Picto, what is it, Pictionary or whatever mm -hmm. those things games are, right? I, or, 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 or where I, I, I give the whole name exactly, even though it can be very far, rather than strategically, you know, go through next series of three questions to make sure that I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm narrowing my choice and what I'll come with the, and then will be the right one, right? So, there is this sense, there is this um, uh, thing which is that intuition. That is this thing where uh, we uh, take, uh, 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 cho make choices that are not purely computational. And how do we model that? And how do we incorporate them and how do we use that it may be biases it may be other you know things that are not for which you don't have quantitative answer how do you bring that in that is something worth thinking about this is rather long term i don't have any near term you know i don't have uh, hope that we can cover with anything that near term as compared to the other things that we talked about involving you know better understanding of intermediate layers or adding some abstraction i think we can get to that sooner about this thing about you know uh, of uh, uh, what did you call snap uh, irrational or you know snap judgment that sounds to be something for which I don't have clear understanding of how would you bring that in uh, you know uh, 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 computationally in any other system that we know of adaptive unconsciousness that's what. Oh, that is what adaptive, adaptive unconsciousness ah, that's the term that he has yeah yeah there was another experiment where the shopkeeper, uh, the shoppers were offered with six different kinds of jam and the other ones were offered with more than six different. So the, shop, the shoppers who were offered six different kinds of jam, they would uh, consider to be, to buy more jam, uh, they would consider buying more jam than the ones that were offered with many uh, choices. So, the, uh, so, they are, so people who are offered with more choices are less likely to reach to a final decision, which is same as the Paul Van Viper tried to limit the amount of excessive information that reached his soldiers in the war game. So based on the another chapter, in the, this was ba uh, basically on the judgment that the, uh, the judgment that we already have. So this is wrong context plus snap de decision sometimes can lead to the disaster. So I'll just play this clip for you guys. Snap judgments. It's about taking snap judgments seriously. And it's not a book that says they're great. It's not a book that says they're terrible. It says that they're a book that says they're both. They can be really good and they can be really bad, and we need to understand them on a very much more sophisticated level if we're to construct a better world for ourselves. And one of the chapters that I have is a story of the shooting of Amadou Diallo, which, as many of you will remember, is um, a case that occupied the headlines five or six years ago in New York. And Diallo was from Guinea in West Africa. He's 22 years old, and he worked as a peddler downtown. He had one of those little carts, and he sold like scarves and socks and things on 14th Street. And he's really short. He's about five foot five or five foot six, and about 150 pounds. I tell you those little details because they're actually important. Because this is a case that's all about the details on one level or another. He lives in a part of the Bronx called South Southview, Soundview, right, which is in the South Bronx. And in the 19, eight, late 1990s, it's a pretty bad neighborhood. There's been a lot of drug problems in it. It's actually a, it was an open-air drug market a block over. It's one of those little narrow old Bronx streets. And 
They have these two-story red brick apartment buildings. And Deanna lives on the second floor. On the night of, um, of February 3rd, 1999, he comes home from working a long day um, at, on 14th Street. And he has some roommates. He goes up and he sees his roommates. And then for reasons we don't quite know, he goes downstairs, probably either to smoke a cigarette or just get some night air. And he stands in the vestibule of his building, his own building. Just stands, and it's about midnight, February 3rd, 1999. As he's been standing there for a couple minutes, a car, Four plainclothes cops drives down Wheeler Avenue. And they see him, right? They see this guy standing outside a house. And there's these four guys in the car, and they're all white. They're all plainclothes cops, and they're part of the special, what's called a special street crime unit. And they're all rookies. They're all pretty raw. And they're all wearing, you know, vests, goose down vests with bulletproof vests underneath them. And they got nine millimeters on their hip and all wearing baseball caps. The name are his names are Ken Boss, um, Sean Carroll, Richard Murphy, and Edward, Edward McMillan. And Carroll, who's in the passenger seat in the front, spots Diallo standing there. And he says, hold up, hold up, what's that guy doing there? Now, Carroll says later that he thought that Diallo was either resembled a rapist they'd been looking for in that area, or that he was a lookout for a push-in robber. And in a push-in robber in New York is where you hit all the buttons on the um, in the vestibule until someone opens their door. You push your way in and you have a little lookout outside. He thought maybe he was a lookout. Um, anyway, so they, and he also, because he thinks it's because as Diallo, as they drive past Diallo, Diallo, who's standing in the vestibule, kind of looks curiously at them, pokes his head around. So they stop the car and they back up, right? And Ken Boss is driving. He's backing the car up Wheeler Avenue. And Diallo's still there. He doesn't move. And they can't believe it. They're like, why isn't this guy running? Right? Anywhere else in the South Bronx, if you're a young black male and a car full of plainclothes cops drives down the street, stops, and backs up towards you, you get the hell out of there, right? But he just sits there, just stands there. Now, later it turns out that Diallo is basically just off the boat. He barely speaks English. Right? All this comes out much later. We, don't, we, don't, uh, we, don't, we didn't know this. They didn't know this at the time. Anyway, Carol and... and um, and uh, McMillan get out of the car and they say, uh, police officers, can we have a word? Right? Diallo just looks at them, doesn't say anything, standing in this little narrow vestibule in front of his building. And all of a sudden, he turns around and runs back towards the front door and starts with one hand fumbling with the doorknob and with his other hand digging into his pocket, right? He's turned sideways, he's digging in his pocket. And Carol shouts out, show us your hands, right? Now, we don't even know at this point whether, whether Diallo understands what they're saying to him. We don't know how much English he knew at that point, but they don't know that either. Carol shouts out, show us your hands. And he doesn't show his hands. He keeps digging in his pocket, and that's making them more and more nervous because they're thinking, why is he digging in his pocket? Right? Why is he trying to hide? Why has he turned his body sideways and tried to hide what he's doing with his hand? So they start running after him. They get out of the car, and they run across, and they go up the steps to the apartment. And Diallo's back is still towards them, and they start screaming at him. Show us your hands. In fact, McMillan says, don't make me fucking kill you at that moment. Right? And Diallo doesn't do anything. He's still got his body turned, and he starts going into his pocket, and he starts bringing out this shiny black object, right? And they're looking at it, and they start fixing it, fixating on this thing, and they see more of it, and more of it, and more of it. And all of a sudden, McMillan says, gun. It's like a gun to him. He goes, gun. And he panics. And in that moment, he shouts out gun, he pulls his own gun out, and he leaps backwards off the front ste off the steps of the apartment building and starts firing. And Carol sees him, and he sees, here's the word gun, he sees McMillan falling backward and thinks, oh, he must have been hit, right? And sees McMillan's bullets ricocheting off the different parts of the vestibule and thinks that those are actually Diallo's bullets. And he pulls his gun out and starts firing. And then the two... So this is an example when the snap judgment went wrong. Although these clinic, like if you look into the professionals such as policemen, clinicians, they are trained to make these snap judgments. It's some, but it is not necessary that we'll always make good decisions. Usually it's related to the fear, I think. The snap decisions might be wrong when people are scared. Yeah. 
they are, but you know, they're very often they are wrong, right? The more, most of the police shooting are justified as the police is fearing for his life, and that's why they shot uh, the uh, you know other person. And uh, if uh, in the U.S. law allows uh, police to uh, be totally free in case police thought, all police has to do is to say he thought. Uh, his life was in danger, and and then anything he does is okay. So yeah, in in, in U.S., uh, so many killings are happening by police uh, when because they they either think or they really are under fear. And yeah, so modeling of the fear is very hard, and uh, the situations that they face, of course, police face is also hard. So it makes it very difficult. Blink from mind blindness to mind readings. So sometimes mind reading failures lie at root of disagreement, misunderstanding and hurt feelings. Face signals can be read to understand what is going on inside our mind. It would just take, if, you're, if, I, if a statement is said to me and I pretend to like it but some, somewhere back in my mind or my unconscious mind says I do not like it. I may give you a nice or happy expression but there will be a slight micro expression which says that I do not like that part. And this is a snap picture from one of the series that's lied to me, where the, this detective, his expertise is detecting, uh, detecting these micro expressions. So conclusion, Gladwell illuminates how our sub subconscious biases affect the way we think and behave. He concludes that we should not always rely on our snap judgments. Try truly successful decision making relies on balance between deliberate and instinctive thinking. Human beings do not always choose to do consciously or uh, choose what to do consciously, but neither are they involuntary conditioned. Freedom is a constantly shifting gray area. Depending on the situation, people's actions are somewhat voluntary and somewhat involuntary. The key to good decision making is not knowledge, not a lot of information given to you. It is understanding. We are swimming in the former, we are desperately lacking in the latter. Question to ponder upon. If brain is a computer, how will brain make, how will computer make snap judgment with little amount of information? And how accurate will it be? For humans, it's not accurate. Yeah. So, so yeah. randomly make any judgment by computer yeah. and, yeah. and this I don't think we need that in a computer. And this but if you say brain is a computer, yeah, we could also eliminate uh, okay. the things which we lack, I mean, which brain lacks and then improve computer better than brain. You can argue that. Uh, does the book uh, tell anything about whether if we have so much information and we have so much time, even though we make snap judgments? So, is it just because we have not enough information and not enough time that we make snap judgments? So the book does talk about that we have a lot of information and a lot of time. Then we are not going to make a snap decision. So there was another experiment that the book was talking about. That was Cook's uh, experiment. So there was a, a hospital and they, the hospital was not well maintained. And it lacks the number of beds that the patient they, they had. and there are, But the intake of patient is very high. So they had the physicians or the clinician or the nurses. They had to quickly make a decision. And... Uh, the manager of the hospital, he tried to come up with an algorithm that was a very old algorithm that how can he actually decide these, these uh, set of patients, they, they should be put up in the critical care and the other can be taken care of uh, on, on the later part. Or they, it's okay to not to utter to them, not to cater to them, you just immediately. If you have a lot of information and a lot of time, why the will you make uh, a snap thing, judgment? Even though snap I judgment is all about you make I something see really quick. something as perfect, but then again, maybe by, by house, uh, even though if you know that this is not good and this is good, at some point you make this gut uh, feeling and you make this decision. I was like, kind of understanding snap judgment as well. That is why I wanted to know. Gut feeling, even if we have a lot of information, even if we have a lot of time, we would, we would ultimately end up with a 
but that gut feeling comes up in like less than two seconds. Uh, you know that okay, you like it or you don't like it. So that's uh, immediate. Can come up in less than milliseconds, right? Hmm. That's measured by a time stamp. Then so that's what snap. Yeah, maybe there is a reasoning for that gut feeling as well. But only thing is, we don't know what's the reason about it. So sure. introspection is really one of the, one of the problem is, is that uh, I, I think. If, suppose there is a feeling, uh, suppose you try to actually model gut feeling. Well, how are you going to, what is the thing that, again, the, I think I see the biggest challenge would, uh, is your gut feeling is very different than my gut feeling. So for us to come with one algorithm for gut feeling is very high. That will capture your gut feeling versus my gut feeling. There, there are some interesting, uh, I think, studies. Um, the point I want to make is the following. First of all, there are interesting studies where they believe that we make up our decisions in a, uh, uh, without all the data or details in a very snap, uh, you know, in, a way, in an instance. Um, as somebody walks into the, uh, in the room for the interview, uh, people have already decided what, you know, the person who is going to interview has already decided whether that he likes or she likes that person or not. And then all the rest of it is simply validating. So the whole process is bias from the very beginning. Okay? And I think that I can rationalize it. I can actually try and explain. Let's say that um, a person, um, so let's say that I don't, so this is actual situation. Uh, a former student of mine went to a place um, uh, where the interview you simply didn't like uh, anybody smoking and you know the uh, interviewer suspected that this person is um, smoking well nothing that person can do will uh, probably um, you know get him through this interview right um, uh, so this is a bias that's already there and the even suspicion of that 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 may be the truth will put you in a uh, a challenging position in, in a position that is almost uh, in, unbelievable. Um, but the point I want to make is that as we try to build better solution, we need to more like think about that individual's perspective that we are not making decisions for all, but decisions for one. You, you know, we are working on health, pro, you know, related. Uh, um, uh, problems and one of the very important thing about health especially for uh, critical care uh, is that um, the decision for exactly the same situations are different for uh, two different person one person chooses quality of life and doesn't want to take chemotherapy other chooses uh, potential of longer living and takes chemotherapy and all the uh, kind of treatment that are available regardless of the cost not just the monetary cost, but any in the cost to the, you know, the body and such, and the quality of life cost, right? So, the point is that um, how do we bring that those issues in? That is an important thing that we don't see enough being addressed, right? In the in the the kind of systems that we want to build for decision making, we need to start thinking about situations that are highly contextualized, highly personalized and provide the ways to factor those things in okay. such that the good so that the system would know so when i talk about competing for human experience that system needs to know what kind of experience i want and the kind of uh, experience i want may be totally different for than the experience that many wants from the same system of let's say healthcare Right? Uh, there are different contexts, uh, ages are different, there are different contexts, uh, you know, expectations for the rest of their life are different, there are different contexts, our education levels are different and, and, and our understanding of what are the outcomes is different. For example, routinely doctors when facing with uh, end of the life situation, they choose not to uh, go for interventional treatments. That's very well known, a very large percentage of doctors say no to interventional treatment at the end for you know when they are facing end of life situation and they don't want because they know that interventional treatments 
uh, lead to poor quality of life and they have come to you know value the quality of life higher than the longevity that uh, potential longevity that the intervention will give you so these that is a very interesting part that we should know i also want to talk about a meta issue one of the reason that Malcolm Gladwell is so successful as he is, is because he is asking questions others are not asking. One of the reason that mo many of the times you analyze people who are successful more much more than others, people who uh, routinely make better decisions, I believe that is often because they have this additional uh, sense of asking of, of asking questions or looking into things that everybody else doesn't. Comes back to my again favorite statement, what is it that you have that others don't? But more specifically here, I am, you know, I think I, I want you to, you are still at a, you know, hopefully an impressionable age where hopefully you can keep in mind that your success, you, 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 you go with the masses, you will, you know, get yourself out and, um, uh, you know, you, you're running a race, right? And you go with the ma masses and you are working very hard and you train very hard and you'll come out ahead in the game. But you may make a different decision and you totally change the game for, you know, you bias the game for you to win without having to fight all the rest, right? From Indian mythology, there is a well, you know, very well-known example of Ganesha. So those of you know that would totally understand what I'm saying, right? So, um, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the, the thing was about, um, you know, uh, uh, the Lord Shiva and Parvati, I don't know exact details, but it's like they have two, you know, Kids, uh, Kartike and 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 uh, who was who became Ganesha, and uh, the idea was that uh, the challenge was who can go around the world the fastest. The elder son took the literal meaning and we, on his you know vehicle, so-called vehicle, you know, we started going around the thing. The younger one said, "My God, my Earth." Why everything is my parents. So he just goes around the parents and he wins. Right? So redefining to your thing or or defining, you know, so yes, both of them are facing the same question. Right? But one finds you might call shortcut, you might call a totally different take. If you can figure that out, you are the outlier. That other thing. Yes. Uh, they say don't believe all what you hear and half of what you see. Um, I think if we as a humans would be able to, to solve this problem, we will be able to hopefully build a model that can learn from this. In the age of big data, more data doesn't mean that I, I'm going to make better decisions. I might be more biased in the system. I might have garbage data actually that can even destroy the, the quality of the models. So that's that's very good point. And I, I, I you know, there, this point that you're making has many different flavors. Um, what, you know, just getting more data, in some cases will be helpful. Good quality, label, label data, you're going to get more of, and this is the algorithm you're going to use. Yes, it will work better. But there are many other questions to ask. Are this the right kind of data, right quality of data? But even other questions is, is this the right question? So, you know, um, more than anything, just you, you remember I always, you know, I, I, I say why is the most important, followed by what and then how. Always. And you, you, have, you have seen that video that I have shared with you guys also. Right? If you did not ask the right question, nothing else you do matters. The same thing will be even when the when you are writing, you know, your paper, when you are doing something, make sure you ask the right question. Make sure the question you ask is very clear. Just today I was reading one of the drafts uh, and 
and and it's it's lousy draft because the question is just not very clear in the abstract. I don't know what question that thing is answering. So here you know, the person I know is working very hard, but that's like working like Kartikeya, and you know uh, it's just not you know um, it's extremely hard to win that way. If you define your question very well, you uh, made it very clear this is either the so, so papers that ask a different question than others ask have much bigger potential impact than pe question, people who ask the same question others ask, they say, I need a little better. So again, when you have that choice, not, you, you don't have that choice all the time, but when you have that, be sure to you know, really ask those questions.